A Neutron walks into a bar and asks, how much for a drink? And the bartender replies, for you, no charge. That's such a bad joke when I love it. <laughs> so we're going to talk about nuclear physics and energy levels. Um, and it's important to talk about uh, different ways of notation. I think once you understand this, it's going to make all the rest of this topic a lot easier. So first of all, the very simple, simple atom. I put that down because it's just, I mean, it's so ridiculously simple. We know now the atom is not really this simple, but for now it suffices it to say this. So inside an atom, there's a central nucleus. That's why we call it nuclear physics, right? Um, we've got neutrons inside and we've got protons inside. That's what N and P mean. And of course, in orbit, we have um, electrons. We're not going to care so much about the electrons for now. By the way, I've made the um, the nucleus extremely big. Obviously, there's a lot of space in an atom. It's almost all space, right? So just keep in mind, you've got a number of neutrons and protons in the center. So that's in the nucleus. That's the part we're going to be mainly concerned with for now. Um, and it's important to talk about the notation. So this would be some general... Uh, whoops, actually, I probably shouldn't say A. I should probably actually say X instead. Um, I think it's maybe better to say that. So I'm going to replace it with uh, something like X. It's just like some element. It doesn't matter what it is. So we normally use Z. And this Z, like this bottom number right here, um, and I'll give you some examples like over here. Um, normally we write this bottom number here. We call this the atomic number. And the reason we call it that is because it's the number um, of protons. So this would be the number of protons in the nucleus. This is the key thing here with this Z, or this atomic number. So that'll tell you the number of protons. So for example, this one right here, HE, that's helium. And you know that there's two protons then. This top number right here is called the mass number. And the mass number tells you the number of nucleons. So you might wonder, what's a nucleon? Nucleon is just a particle in the nucleus. In other words, it's equal to n plus p. In other words, the number of neutrons plus the number of protons. So in this case right here, for example, with helium, we've got uh, two protons and we've got four nucleons. Now, two of them are already protons, so two, uh, four minus two is two. So that's how we know there are, um, let's just say, two neutrons, and we can say. There's two neutrons in here. Here, there's two protons. And this is how it works, okay? This is the notation that we use. The important thing is that the element name, for example, helium, and that bottom number, the atomic number, they're redundant. What I mean by redundant is that uh, you don't need them. You could just say helium and you know it's two because this bottom number tells you which element on the periodic table it is. So now we know that helium is a second element. You know, we know that hydrogen is the first. And it's this top number that might vary, but not the bottom number, so they're redundant. That's why we often call this helium-4. We don't have to say helium-2-4 because this 2 on the bottom is redundant. Saying helium, we know it's got to be 2. As soon as you make it number 3, it's the next element. It can't be helium, and so on. So we've got quickly got isotopes. Uh, those are just a same atomic number. So for example, we can have carbon. That's a nice simple uh, example. So we've got two different versions of carbon, which is the sixth element, but different mass number. We can have carbon 12 and we can have carbon 14. So these are called isotopes of each other. You can see that this carbon 14 has more neutrons than carbon 12 does, but has the same number of protons because the bottom number is the same. So that was like really, really simple overview, right? More interesting then is the energy levels. So what happens is in an atom, um, you've got, of course, those nucleons in the center, the neutrons and the protons, and around it go these electrons. Those electrons are important um, as far as these energy levels because what will happen is they can get excited by maybe they, for example, absorb a photon. Uh, or maybe you apply a potential difference across them. That's what happens in like a lot of those um, fluorescent lights, for example, in a room. Maybe the room you're sitting in has fluorescent lights in it right now. So if you look at that, what happens is you end up taking en um, electrons and you excite them into what we call an excited state. So I could maybe draw that. I could draw myself like uh, some line like this right here, and another line like this, maybe another line like this. I'm just trying to draw some parallel lines here. I'm doing a bad job of it, but there we go. What will happen then is these electrons maybe it goes all the way up to the very top and what happens is this when they drop down in energy so for example uh, right here so maybe so now it's in an excited state and maybe now it drops down like this right here to that energy level when it did that 
it's going to emit a photon. It's going to emit some light. So we normally write that with a curvy line. We could say it's a photon. And that photon will have a very specific energy. This is the key thing here with this. It goes E equals HF. This is the key equation here that you need for this stuff here. This is on your data booklet, so you don't have to memorize it. But it goes E equals HF, where E is the energy of the photon. Now that could be in uh, joules, but we normally do the energy in EV. So of course you can do in joules, or you can do electron volts. H is just a constant, you look it up. What is it, 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34, so it's called Planck's constant. Uh, and what's important is this, energies that we find of photons, for example, the energy is quantized. What I mean by quantized means it only comes in multiples of H. You can have 2H or 3H or 4H, but it's always a multiple of this sort of magical number, this Planck's constant. Then we have F is the frequency of the photon. I remember frequency is measured in hertz, or it could be in uh, seconds to the minus one. That's the same thing as a hertz. Now keep in mind, there's a lot of other energy levels uh, transitions possible. So can you notice it could have dropped here, then it could drop down two of these, or it could go down here, and then it could go down here. Do you see there's a lot of different combinations? It could also drop from, let's just say we kept going here, it could also drop from here to here. Um, it could drop all the way down in one go. So do you see there's a lot of these different energy levels possible? And each of those energy levels, do you see this, this, this difference in energy here? You'd have to actually measure it. Whatever that distance is, that's E. So then you know the type of photon you're going to get because that tells you the frequency of the photon. It's unique. So for example, this one right here will have a very different energy than that one right there, right? Because this one has a much larger energy. And a larger energy means that a larger frequency photon. So this is really important. This basically tells you the different colors that are possible because, you know, the frequency of a photon is its color in a sense, even if it's even if you can't see it. Uh, but I mean, it really tells you that the frequency is related to its wavelength. So you, so if you ever get a question like this, you have to think of all the different transitions possible, you know, so from the top, you can go down all the way to the bottom, you can go down until the second last one, like I did, you can go down just that one. And then from here, you can go all the way down or one and one. Uh, so this is how it works. And I, I hope this is clear. Because of course, you can always raise and drop by lots of different things. But this is actually what explains the uh, quantized nature of this light. In other words, you won't have every frequency possible, you only have these specific allowed frequencies. Uh, so that's really important. Now, if you want, you can also translate to sort of uh, rewrite this equation, because we have this equation here, E equals HF. Uh, but we also have the equation uh, we call the wave equation. You know, some people call it V equals F lambda. If it's light, we say C equals F lambda. So that's the speed uh, equals the frequency times the wavelength. And if we want to do that, we could replace for F. We can get F by itself. So that would be C over lambda. That means that we could rewrite this equation, which when E equals HF, we can say E equals H. And instead of F, we put in C equals lambda. And from there, then we can take lambda, put it over here to the top here. So we can say lambda equals and it's HC over E. And that's where that equation right there came from. This is just a different version of E equals HF. This is it relating to wavelengths. So if you want the wavelength of the photon, there you go. And a nice easy thing to remember is that frequency and wavelength do opposites. So if you have a large frequency, for example, uh, this transition right here has a very large frequency because it has a very large energy well then it's going to have a very small wavelength because they work opposites to each other. Maybe then that's a good idea to do this example. This is from an exam, so something like this. Electrons in an atom are excited and they have a following energy levels possible when they go down in energy. Of course there's other ones possible, but I'm just drawing these four to choose from. So which of the transitions has the smallest wavelength? So if you think about this one now, uh, let's see, what do we want here? Remember E equals HF. And if we have smallest, you have to remember this, okay? So smallest, we're looking for the smallest wavelength, right? That means it's the largest frequency. This is the key thing to remember here, is that if we want the smallest wavelength, we want the largest frequency. And if we have E equals HF, that means then we want the largest energy. We want the largest energy value. So which one has the largest energy? Can you see how easy it was? It was A. So again, just to explain it, remember, um, e equals HF, so that tells you the energy of the photons is related to the frequency. They want the smallest wavelength, and frequency and wavelength work opposite to each other. Uh, 
So if we want the smallest lambda, then we want the largest f. And since e equals hf, the largest f is found by the largest e. That's why we want the largest energy. Not so bad, huh?